At the heart of Africa, life is quietly retreating. Across the Sahel Belt, where 135 million people still cling to the land to survive, tens of thousands of hectares of fertile soil are lost to desertification every single year. To the north, the Sahara relentlessly drains what little moisture remains, causing most young plants to wither and die before they can take root, leaving every effort to restore the land hanging by a fragile thread. It feels as though everything is working against humanity. Yet, in the midst of this despair, a strange solution has been proposed. Releasing tortoises into the desert. Why tortoises? How could a slow-moving, seemingly fragile creature possibly make a difference in one of the harshest environments on Earth? Today, join Terran Works as we uncover the secret that is forcing scientists to rethink humanity's entire strategy against desertification. Imagine a land larger than the entire United States, yet functioning like a vast machine of aridity. That is the Sahara. Covering more than 360 million hectares, it is not merely a desert, but an extreme climatic system that has been operating continuously for thousands of years. In many regions, rainfall is virtually non-existent. In some places, decades pass without a single drop of rain. During the day, ground temperatures often exceed 40 degrees Celsius, baking every exposed surface. When night falls, the air cools rapidly, creating intense hot-cold cycles powerful enough to fracture soil structure. But what truly makes the Sahara terrifying is not just the heat, but its ability to drain moisture. With evaporation rates reaching up to 236 inches per year, even the rare rains vanish before they can penetrate deep into the soil. On this already exhausted land, hot winds and sandstorms continue to sweep across the landscape carrying fine dust to the desert's edges and suffocating young seedlings just as they begin to emerge. Situated between the arid Sahara and the tropical regions to the south, the Sahel exists as a fragile frontier of life. Though only a semi-arid belt of land, it carries the livelihoods of more than 135 million people, most of whom depend directly on small-scale farming and livestock herding. As a result, even minor changes in land and water conditions can quickly escalate into a crisis of survival. The Sahel does receive rainfall, but the limited amount is never enough to compensate for what nature quietly takes away through prolonged dry seasons. Over time, the topsoil is stripped away by hot winds and erosion, exposing a hardened surface almost as solid as stone. Once soil structure is damaged, rainwater can no longer infiltrate deeper layers, plant roots fail to anchor, and the ecosystem's ability to recover gradually disappears. Most strikingly, this degradation does not unfold dramatically. It reveals itself in the smallest signs, shrubs growing ever sparser, grasslands shrinking, herds forced to travel farther in search of water and forage, and once cultivated fields increasingly abandoned to dust and silence. As the Sahel gradually loses its ability to regenerate itself, scientific attention has begun to turn toward a once-overlooked native species, the Sulcata tortoise, also known as the African Spurred tortoise. This species was once widespread across the region, but livestock grazing and habitat loss have caused its population to decline sharply, leaving it present in only about 16% of its original range. As the tortoises disappeared, the ecological roles they once fulfilled vanished with them, and land degradation began to accelerate. At first, the idea of reintroducing tortoises sounded implausible. Could such a slow-moving animal really make a difference in a harsh desert environment? Yet it is precisely their ability to adapt over millions of years to arid conditions that led to sulcata tortoises being selected for conservation programs, particularly in Senegal. Since the mid-2000s, international and local organizations have carried out tortoise reintroduction efforts in the furlough region recording high survival rates and clear signs of natural reintegration. Although these initiatives are not yet considered a large-scale solution to desertification, they have opened up a new perspective. Restoring a native species also means gradually restoring the ecological functions that were once broken. 
You see, what truly captured researchers' attention was not the sulcata tortoise's speed or strength, but a behavior that has defined it for millions of years. Digging. With powerful forelimbs shaped like natural shovels, these tortoises can excavate shelter burrows several meters long, sometimes reaching depths of three to nine meters. These tunnels are not only vital for survival, but also play a crucial role in arid ecosystems. In the Sahel, the ground is often baked so hard that it forms a crust almost like concrete, preventing rainwater from penetrating and allowing fertile topsoil to be easily swept away. But when tortoises begin to dig, that structure is broken apart. Soil is turned over and loosened, creating openings that humans could only replicate with heavy machinery. Each tortoise burrow becomes a breathing chamber for the land, allowing rainwater to infiltrate deeper, improving air circulation underground. On the surface, footprints and digging marks create countless micro depressions that trap seeds and retain moisture. This process unfolds slowly but persistently. Each tortoise functions as a natural plow, and when many individuals coexist, these small impacts link together, gradually improving entire stretches of land, a phenomenon scientists describe as redesigning ecosystems from the soil up. However, tortoises were not the first path humanity chose. Long before native ecological solutions were taken seriously, the Sahel had been placed into a far bigger, faster, and more ambitious gamble, the Great Green Wall. Launched in 2007 by the African Union, the project set out to restore degraded land along the Sahelian Belt, stretching nearly 8,000 kilometers from Senegal in the west to Djibouti in the east. In its early vision, the Great Green Wall was imagined as a continuous wall of trees, wide and dense enough to halt the southward advance of the Sahara. The goal was to restore roughly 100 million hectares of degraded land while creating sustainable livelihoods for millions of people across the region. But the Sahel does not operate according to blueprints. Erratic climates, scarce rainfall, and prolonged droughts quickly expose the limits of large-scale tree planting. By the end of 2023, international reports indicated that only about 15 to 20 percent of the overall targets had been achieved, with visible success confined to a handful of countries. Elsewhere, young trees died before they could take root, succumbing to drought, sandstorms, and the absence of long-term care. In some areas, local communities were forced to uproot the trees for firewood, not because they doubted the project, but because it was their only means of survival. Today, the Great Green Wall continues to take shape, piece by piece. Yet at the same time, it has left behind a profound lesson. Humans cannot impose their will upon the desert. The Sahel does not merely need a wall to stand against nature. It needs solutions that listen, adapt, and move in rhythm with the land itself. If the Great Green Wall sought to redraw the desert's boundary on a map, the Sulcata tortoise reshapes the Sahel in a very different way. Step by slow step, and beneath the surface of the land itself. As tortoise tracks gradually imprint the sands of the Sahel, their impact extends far beyond the places they physically inhabit. Over time, areas frequently visited by tortoises begin to emerge as ecological anchor points, places where life returns earlier than in the surrounding landscape. Vegetation regenerates first, forming sparse but vital patches of green capable of stabilizing the soil. Insects follow, then small herbivores, and eventually lower-level predators. A chain of biological recovery takes shape, not simultaneously, not dramatically, but with a clear and orderly progression. Ecologists describe this as clustered restoration rather than large-scale recovery. In an environment as harsh as the Sahel, it is precisely these scattered pockets of life that determine an ecosystem's capacity to endure. In this way, sulcata tortoises do not green the Sahel nor do they reverse desertification in the short term. Instead, they perform a quieter task, keeping the ecosystem from collapsing entirely, just enough for natural processes to continue moving forward. The early results from Sulcata tortoise reintroduction programs in Senegal quickly drew the attention of the international conservation community. At the center of these efforts is the Furlough Biosphere Reserve in northern Senegal, 
where the program has been implemented continuously since 2006. According to conservation reports, approximately 80% of the tortoises reintroduced in furlough have survived in the wild, and many individuals have begun to reproduce, a rare outcome under the harsh conditions of the Sahel. These successes laid the groundwork for gradually expanding the reintroduction model beyond Senegal, extending into Mali, Niger, and Chad. In these countries, tortoises are bred under controlled conditions, released in small batches, and monitored over the long term to minimize risks to wild populations. Today, the reintroduction of sulcata tortoises is no longer merely an effort to save a species from extinction. It has become part of a broader native ecological restoration approach in the Sahel, one in which restoring even the smallest natural links can generate resilient and lasting impacts. Yet tortoises were not the only species brought back to the Sahel. Before them, this land had witnessed the complete disappearance of a larger, faster animal, one that once symbolized the semi-desert grasslands, the scimitar-horned oryx. For centuries, oryx roamed across the Sahel, perfectly adapted to heat and drought. But hunting rifles, combined with the expansion of livestock grazing, pushed the species to the brink. By the end of the 20th century, the oryx had officially vanished from the wild, its name surviving only in conservation lists and distant captive breeding facilities. It was not until 2008 that a bold effort began in Chad, returning the oryx to the very land that had lost it. After years of preparation, in 2016, the first 25 individuals were released into the wild. Then something few dared to expect happened. Calves were born within the first year, marking the species' first natural reproduction after decades of absence. From that moment on, the oryx population began to grow steadily. By 2023, numbers had surpassed 600 individuals, enough to demonstrate that the return was no longer an experiment. In 2024, the species' status was downgraded from extinct in the wild to endangered, one of the rarest conservation comebacks in modern history. Beyond saving a species from disappearance, the return of the oryx has also contributed to restoring Sahelian land. Their hooves create small water-holding depressions, and their dung adds organic matter, modest impacts, yet sufficient to help trigger the return of life across the semi-desert landscape. As tortoises dig deep into the soil and antelopes redraw their ancient migration routes, the Sahel still lacks one final piece, a species fast enough and resilient enough to connect scattered pockets of life. That species is the North African ostrich. Once striding across vast semi-desert landscapes, the world's fastest running bird disappeared from large parts of the Sahel due to hunting and the degradation of its habitat. It was not until 2016 that efforts to return ostriches to the wild officially began in Chad and Niger. Individuals were raised in semi-wild conditions, carefully monitored before release, and gradually reintroduced to their former range. Early results were highly encouraging. Survival rates of around 85% showed that ostriches had retained their ability to cope with the harsh conditions of the Sahel. Their return has also brought subtle changes. As ostriches forage and move across the land, they disturb the hardened soil, leaving behind small depressions that collect rainwater and dispersing seeds through their droppings. Like tortoises and oryx, ostriches do not fight the desert. They simply help the Sahel function once again in the way nature originally intended. The Sahel will not be saved by a single miracle, not by lines of trees drawn across a map, nor by massive projects imposed from the outside. If this land still holds a chance of recovery, it will come from the creatures that once truly belonged here. Sulcata tortoises dig into the soil, retain moisture, and reawaken life from the depths. Scimitar-horned oryx reconnect ancient migration routes, bringing grasses back to the surface. North African ostriches link fragmented ecosystems through their enduring movements. Each species creates only a small impact, but when placed in the right context, those impacts begin to restore the natural rhythm of the Sahel. The fight against desertification is not a battle against nature, but a process of repairing what has been broken. And sometimes, to save an entire landscape, 
what is needed is not force, but patience, and the ability to listen as nature heals itself. What do you think about this approach? Could restoring ecosystems through native species like the sulcata tortoise be the most sustainable path to combating desertification? Share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to continue exploring these journeys with TerranWorks.